So welcome to the January 11th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We hope to have you back. For those of you who attend, glad to see you. Happy New Year. And uh, just for, for those who are the first time, the British Empire Study Group is a bunch of philatelists, postal historians, collectors, and non-collectors that get together and we enjoy talks that are based upon the postal history. But now uh, everyone should be in. So we're gonna start the program. This is a journey through Brunei's postal history from 1895 from Claire, you know, with Claire Scott. I am going to turn it over right now to my co-host, Robert Lutens, to introduce Claire. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much, Joan. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to this year's series. It's my privilege to introduce you to our esteemed presenter this evening, Claire Scott. Her melee name, Kumala Indira, which means jewel of countless price, was given to her by Sir Omar al Saifuddin, the Sultan of Brunei, from 1950 to 1968. Claire is an absolutely amazing postal historian. She started collecting stamps around the age of eight, first exhibited as a teenager, and has exhibited at the national and international level around the world. Her collecting of Brunei started when she was 16 and has continued throughout her life, and today her collection is recognized as the world's best. She's a fellow of the Royal Philatelic Society of London, a member of the Club de Monte Carlo, past president and honorary editor of the Postal History Society, member and past editor of the British Borneo Society, member of the France and Colony Society, and member of the Society of Postal Historians. She is also chairman of the Salisbury and District Philatelic Society. Her other collections include Death by Post, which has an international gold medal, The Wounded Soldier's Story, a World War I wounded soldier's journey from the front to Blighty. From beef tea to battleships, William Grinnell Co-Mariner and Submariner, which was published as a book by the Postal History Society. And finally, The Poor Laws, which were a precursor of the social services later on to be adopted you know, in national health. Claire is married to John Scott and the duo operate the History Store, which is at historystore.com.uk. So without further ado, here's Claire Scott. Okay, good evening, and thank you for asking me to give this presentation. Looks good. I'm aware that most of you will know little about this very small, oil rich Malay Muslim Sultanate. This evening, I'm showing you an overview of the development of the postal system from 1895 to independence in 1984. To fit this into our time frame, you may need to hold on to your hats. Little is known about the communication system between Brunei and the outside world prior to the Europeans appearing in the Far East. Their impact on this part of the world was dramatic, being evaded twice by the Spanish who wanted the Philippines, and the arrival of James Brooke in Borneo had a profound effect on the area, not always a positive one. The first postal system, as we understand it today, began with coal. Concession to the open cast coal mine outside Muara was granted to William Clark Cowie in 1883 by Sultan Mumin. In 1887, Sultan Hashim ceded the coal fields and rights over the Mara district to Cowie. But by 1888, Cowie and his brother had run out of money to develop the mine and had no option but to sell. And the obvious buyer was Raja Charles Brooke. Charles Brooke had employed a Scotsman, John Robertson, at the Sedong coal mine and in 1888 appointed him as manager of the newly acquired Moira Colliery, which Charles renamed Brookton. The Sarawa government ran a postal agency to enable the company to send information to Sarawa, and the early date recorded on a Sarawa stamp is 14th of April 1894. To date, no Brookton cover has been found. The early date on a Brunei stamp is 16th of January 1907. It was while working here that Robertson made the acquaintance of the Sultan of Brunei. Robertson persuaded the Sultan that he needed a commercial postal service with mail being carried to Labuan, 
which entered the International Postal System and a fortnightly steamer delivered and collected mail en route to Singapore. Robertson was granted a concession and was authorized to design and print stamps to the value of $5,000 in exchange for the no monopoly of the sale of the stamps outside of Brunei. For many years, it was thought that the design was based on the Belgian Congo Postal Stationery card, as there are many similarities with the palms and star, but the finished design is thought to be an interpretation of Brunei town with the surrounding hills, the palms and the star. The pencil sketches and watercolour images suggest that the artist was European, as the initial ship drawn and painted was European in style. The Scottish printers McClure, MacDonald and Co of 164 Bothwell Street, Glasgow, are thought to have been engaged to print the stamps, probably at their London works, which were lithographed in sheets of 50, 10 by 5, on unwatermarked paper with waxed interleaving and perforated line 13 and a half. The stamps are in three different languages, English, Jawi, and Chinese. Robson Lowe, the phil philatelic dealer, found a dealer's stock of complete sheets in Scotland. One sheet was the 10 cents in perfect proof, which she cut up. Two strips of the 5 cents and single 8 cents of perfect have since emerged. However, I learnt this week of another strip of 5 cent and a single 5 cent. A supply of stamps was sent to Brunei, and it was believed that the post office in Brunei town opened on the 22nd of July, 1895. However, two covers dated 18th of July have been found, the Whitfield King being one of them. Brunei was not a member of any postal union, and the stamps were only valid for mail carriage from Brunei to the next country, usually Labuan. Letters beyond Labuan had to have Labuan stamps fixed to pay for the onward postage. Robertson had an agreement with Parker and Peed, the stamp dealers in London, who produced a mass mailing dated 22nd of July, 1895. A high percentage of these have survived. Outside the mass mailing, there are nine commercial covers and two commercial Labon three cents postal stationery cards known used during the period 1895 to 1902. There are also four covers known that went through the post without Labon stamps. The Sanger cover, the bottom one, being the latest known date of usage of this issue. This cover is interesting in a number of ways. It is the only known example of the British consulate official mail in this period, being dated 7th of June 1899. The signal under the cachet confirmed free postage. However, one can see that stamps had been affixed in Brunei and then removed in Labuan, where the Labuan date stamp of the 8th of June was applied over where the stamps had been. By 1905, the economic impact and internal strife kindled by Charles Brooke led to the British government sending out Mr. M. S. H. MacArthur, a Malay, Malay government civil servant, to write a report on the state of affairs. Brooke and his supporters were pushing for Brunei to be handed over to him, but MacArthur's very thorough report made it clear that he believed that what was best for the country was for Britain to be set up as a residency and to take over the running of the country. MacArthur was duly appointed resident in 1906. He proceeded to regularise the communication system and to organise for an issue of stamps to be produced. While this was taking place, he arranged for the residue of the Labon Crown issue stamps to be overprinted and surcharged to make up the necessary denominations. The overprinting was very efficient and there are only two major flaws. The two cents on eight cents row five has a double overprint, while row 10 has a stamp with the surcharge omitted. One sheet of the two cents on three cents has a double overprint of Brunei in row five, which the printer attempted to remove, and also the denomination is double. The post office clerk discovered one sheet overprinted in black mm -hmm. instead of red, and informed McClelland, the assistant resident who was acting as postmaster. McClellan sent several self-addressed envelopes and kept some of the mint stamps. The design chosen for the first stamps was to have houses on stilts from the Kampong Aya, the water village, with a native boat. Dillaru was appointed by the Crown agents and in 1906 hand-painted proofs were presented for approval, both undenominated and denominated. Once approved, a single plate was created with one cent in the value tablet, 
as she was printed in each of the colour options. A stamp was cut out of the sheet and applied to heavy paper to create the appendix sheets. Appendix sheet A was approved. The stamps arrived in Brunei in 1907. And Delarue kept a complete set of specimens as control, colour control, along with the ink recipes, which they altered when the colours were changed in 1908. Money being very tight, the stamps were released as the Lavan stamps were used up, as illustrated by these combination covers, which are the only ones I have seen. This cover, ex King Carlos, King Carol of Romania, has the only postally used pair of the two cents on three cents double overprint. The island trading syndicate had a cutch factory, but little mail seems to have survived. I have seen two examples. Cutch was made from the bark of the mangrove and was used in the tanning industry. Brunei joined the Straits Settlements Postal Union, which allowed its stamps to be recognised for international mail. And from 1908, changes were made to the colours to bring them in line with the UPU colour scheme, which it was able to join in 1916. The first three stamps of Appendix B were used in the new colour scheme. This design and some of the plates were in continual use until 1952, a total of 45 years. These archive specimens show the progression of the colour changes. Post offices were opened in Tutong, Belite, Temburong and Mwara in 1908. However, the annual report of 1910 indicates that that is the first year that they had stamps for sale. Communication within the country was mostly by boat, runners using jungle tracks and the beach at low tide. Runners took mail from Brunei to Tutong, which took a day and was halfway between the capital and Belai. The Belai cover was registered. However, in 1923, the post office had not received a rubber registration stamp or paper labels. Registered number 680 was written, and when it reached Brunei town, the post office there applied a rubber registration cache. Registration cost 12 cents and postage to England was 6 cents each ounce. Temburong's population was small, and these are my earliest covers, which had to be carried by boat to Brunei town before taking them to Labuan. After the closure of the Brookton sub post office, the Brunei post office opened in Mora. There was little pre war uh, mail that has survived or been found. 1910 saw the arrival of the $5 and the $25, which were produced for fiscal use following the change of law requiring revenue fees to be paid by stamps. The stock was kept by the resident who acted as the postmaster general and the head of the judiciary. The paid councillor was probably made from rubber and would have worn quite quickly. I have five varieties of the councillor in the collection, of which I illustrate three. In 1911, De La Rue made new plates with the bottom line of the water removed, thus requiring proofs to be approved. Illustrated the approved proof dated 1911 and a pair from the undenominated proof sheet and a one cent and three cent in perf proof. De La Rue was required to provide specimens for these changes. The first census in Brunei of 1911 recorded 20 Europeans, two Eurasians, out of a total of 21,718 for all races. The post office recorded 2,968 ordinary letters and 1,691 registered letters were posted. Parcels were not listed separately and are scarce. All pre-war postcards are rare. The first recorded postcard in Brunei is the Straits Settlements picture postcard posted on the 16th of November 1907, and the first picture postcard of Brunei was posted the next day, the 17th. Most early picture postcards are of the Kampong Aya, and these photographic cards were printed in 1913. A circular date stamp that year was applied to the front. Subsequently, a one cent stamp was attached and cancelled in 1922. They thought to have been produced as souvenirs for visitors. The top example was postally used and sent to Belgium in 1914. 
It was underpaid and a tax mark of two over 10 cents was applied to indicate the sufficiency. This is the earliest recorded tax mark to date. Three examples have been found, one dated 1918 and the third 1923. The British publisher Sandbride produced eight picture postcards. They were not so only recorded used from North Borneo. The postcard of the Brockton Wharf from the Moira fishing boats illustrated earlier were also printed by Sandbride. Photographic postcards are more difficult to find, especially postally used, which is the only way to accurately date them. This photographic postcard is of the first palace built on land in 1921, the Astana Majalis, during the reign of Sultan Jamal al Alam, who reigned from 1906 to 1924. It was probably destroyed during the Allied bombing during World War II, and the palace site is where the current post office has been built. Kuala Balai was the exchange town with Sarawak and initially the main base for expatriate workers after the discovery of oil in 1929. Their arrival increased the demands for more efficient communication, both within the country and also with the outside world. During the 1920s, De La Rue changed their printing process from printing on wet paper to printing on dry, and the change in the postal rates required a six cents empire rate and a 12 cents foreign rate stamps. Lucien Allen, who was resident from 1921 to 1923 and postmaster general, decided on a new design for these stamps. His father made a drawing from a photograph he had taken of the old town from near the residency, which is today the oldest building in Brunei. Proofs for an unusual, unused design show a very similar vignette. As this was a new design, an appendix sheet had to be produced for approval with proofs. The success of the oil fields necessitated the opening of a post office at Surya to cope with the increase in mail. Two pre-war covers cancelled Surya have been found, and around five stamps so far. By 1935, a twice-weekly mail bus service was operating between Brunei Town and Tutong, and then on to Kuala Balai. The six cents scarlet on the lower cover was released in 1936. A proof was produced for approval, signed off on 23rd of December 1934. In 1933, an order was placed with De La Rue for size G registered envelopes, and a proof for the 15 cent stamp was produced. However, the order was cancelled, and the central proof is the only record of this order, with the date and order number in pencil on the reverse. It wasn't until 1935 that another order was placed for size G and size H envelopes. Only one pre-war used size H is known. The 1930s, a very interesting period for airmail. The British government was pushing Imperial Airways to extend their flown services to Australia. However, the first Brunei airmails came from an unlikely source. In 1930, the RAF sent a group of flying boats to Singapore to form number 205 Flying Boat Squadron based at Salatar, comprising two Southampton Mark II flying boats, the S1419 and the S1149, which carried out a reconnaissance flight of the coast of Borneo in May 1930 to find a suitable base for the ensuing survey of the coral reefs off North Borneo by the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. Having completed their initial survey, they began their return flight to Singapore. And when both aircraft left Brunei on 1st of July, they carried 28 pieces of mail. This was the first airmail service from Brunei. In 1931, the RAF stopped at Brunei in April and in the May, and again took a mail bag to Singapore. But they did not carry any mail from Brunei on any of their later flights. For many years, there had been discussions as to why the mail addressed to Kuching went to Singapore and was then returned to Kuching bearing in mind that the flying boats stopped at Kuching on their journey. Post office receipt refers to a closed bag being carried, which answers the question. There can only have been three receipts, and this is the only known survivor. Someone had fun creating this cover to Penang, as they also used stamps from the 1895 concessionary issue. For my book, I'm trying to find out how many of these covers have survived, 
And to date, I have found 11 of the 28 1930 flight, nine of the April 1931 flight, and also nine of the May 1931 flight um, and a piece. If you have any of these, or if you know anybody who has any of these, could some could they please send me a scan so that I can add them to the list? The aim of the Imperial Airways Eastern Route was to link countries with the British Empire. And as politics and technical advances allowed, the route, the route gradually extended. The London to Karachi service started on the 30th of March 1929, and it was extended to Delhi in December of that year. During 1933, this service was extended to Calcutta in the July, Rangoon in September, and December was extended from Rangoon to Singapore via Bangkok and Alor Star. Qantas Airways Australia had the contract from Brisbane to Singapore where mail was exchanged. The first experimental fully flown Imperial Airways and Qantas flight to Australia took place in 1931, and the full service started on the 8th of December 1934. From 25th of September 1930, KLM, the Royal Dutch Airlines, had operated the longest regular airmail route from Amsterdam to Batavia, which is modern Jakarta in Java. Mail using this service had to bear by KLM on the front of the envelope, and having arrived at Singapore, was carried by the surface route to Alor Star, where it joined the KLM flight to Amsterdam. Despite being more expensive, it continued to be used after Imperial Airways opened their route to Singapore in 1933, as it was significantly faster. The all up airmail scheme was extended to the Strait settlements, Brunei, Sarawak, North Borneo, and Malaya in 1938. And this service continued until the outbreak of war in Europe, with the combined airmail fee being eight cents. The cover to Canada has the second type of tax mark applied and the deficiency was two cents. The Japanese invaded in December 1941, and mail to and from Brunei was suspended prior to this. The Japanese overprinted the stamps of Brunei, Sarawak, and North Borneo with the Imperial Japanese government and treated the three territories as one, the stamps being usable throughout. This is a fascinating and complex period to study. Internal Brunei mail is difficult to find, as much of the population had left, been interned, or did not write in fear of the possible consequences. Unused stamps are easier to find, or postally used, Brunei postally used in Sarawak. Post-war, many forgeries of the overprint on genuine stamps appeared to meet the philatelic demand, which can put uh, collectors off. And this slide, uh, all of these stamps are forgeries. Liberation followed the landing of units of the 9th Australian Division from the 9th of September 1945, and Major General Hiroyo Yamamura, Commanding General of the Japanese Forces in Kuching, handed over his samurai sword to the commander of the Australian Division, Brigadier Thomas Charles Eastwick, in a solemn sur surrender ceremony held on board the Royal Australian Navy Corvette, the HMAS Kapunda on the 11th of September 1945 at 2 p.m. Australian stamps were made available to the troops to enable them to write home. The Japanese had carried out a scorched earth policy prior to the Australian's arrival, setting fire to the oil wells and burning the contents of the post offices, which is why there are no pre-war postal records in Brunei. The Australians handed over administrative control to the British on the 17th of December 1945, who overprinted old stock of Sarawak and North Borneo stamps with BMA, British Military Administration. And a three-line linotype stamp was created for use in the three territories, while new printings of stamps could be arranged and a semblance of order was returned to the countries. There are varieties in, in the linotypes. There was a worldwide shortage of paper immediately following the end of the war, and this can be seen in the variety of registered labels that were used. The pre-war, uh, some printed on Gastetna machines, on pink paper, and typed with a blue box. BOAC replaced Imperial Airways and resumed flights in 1946, 
her flights across the Atlantic were not resumed by the February, and the sender had to write airmail to London only, and the manuscript airmail has been nullified by the red marks. The Kuala Balai three-line cancel is difficult uh, to find, being short-lived. And you can see that by July 1946, a full service to the USA had resumed. The civil government of the Sultan took over on the 6th of July 1946, and the organisation of the post office was unchanged from pre-war, with the resident continuing to assume the functions of a postmaster general and the district officers assuming the functions of local postmasters. The 1947 divisit issue was released in January using the pre-war design and a number of the pre-war plates. The one dollar on the left is scarlet from the 1947 printing, while the one on the right is carmine from the 1950 printing. The five cents with the arrow pointing down is position row one stamp eight with the constant retouch to the five and the C, which first appeared in the 1924 reprints. Only sheets which left the Crown agents and were sent to the country for usage were numbered, illustrated here by sheet number 094, which is from the 1947 printing, where sheet 0540 is from the 1950 printing, and both show the retouch. The top cover has a red Gestetner type registered label similar to the black one I showed earlier. The stamps are cancelled with an Australian type circular date stamp that was introduced to all of the territories until the usual date stamps could be replaced. There is also an example of the five cent row one stamp eight retouch and an AV2 cache, making this a very interesting cover. During the month of November, the quantity of mail carried by the British mail services was counted in bundles and the top envelope received the AV2 cache. The Belight cover of 1948 has the pre-war printed registered label. Sultan Ahmed Tajuddin celebrated his Silver Jubilee in 1949, and a set of three stamps were produced. These working essays are watercolour paintings with pencil notes indicating their size of 42 by 27 and a corrected denomination. And the first day cover has the crest of the Sultan on the flap. He was succeeded following his sudden and unexpected death by his brother, Sir Omar Ali Safuddin. The new definitive issue was released in 1952, which is the first change of design since 1907. Green paper was used by De La Rue for test printings, and here the vignette is on one side and the frame is on the obverse. The proof examples are on white unwatermarked paper, and a sheet of the portrait was printed to test for faults. The high values appear to have used the same design as Sultan Tajuddin's silver jubilee stamps, replacing his portrait with a crest and the denomination replacing the text. There's also marked similarity between the vignettes and the 1924 issue of the high values. My grandparents visited their family in 1954, and they are here with the Sultan and the Sultana, and it is this Sultan who gave me my name before I was christened. A commemorative issue of stamps was produced to celebrate the opening of the mosque in 1958, the first of this reign, and the photographic proofs of 1957 illustrate the development of the design through to the finished stamp. It's a very photogenic building. The pre-war residency system was reinstated after the war, which meant that Britain continued to be responsible for the administration of the country excluding religion. The new Sultan set about designing a new constitution, which was enacted in 1959, which handed the administrative control of the country to him. Britain maintained responsibility for foreign affairs and security, and the residency was replaced with the High Commissioner. On December the 7th, 1962, the Commander-in-Chief Singapore warned of a probable attack on the oil fields, either in Surya or Miri, an action began on the 8th of December in the 4th and 5th divisions of Sarawak, Brunei Town, Tutong, Muara, Surya, and the Anduki airstrip. This coincided with the first three Brunei officers completing their military training in Malaya. Up to this date, no British servicemen had been based in Brunei, 
However, following the rebellion and the subsequent confrontation with India, Indonesia, which lasted until 1966, Gurkha regiments have maintained a presence protecting Syria and the oil fields. This undeclared war provides some interesting British forces postal history. The Royal Brunei Air Armed Forces was formed in 1961. The Navy, which is based at Mara, and the Air Wing was established in 1965. This subject can be illustrated through the official caches and as a large subject in its own right. Coil stamps were made from the 10 cent stamp from the glazed paper printed issued on the 11th of March 1970. The sheets were stuck together bottom to top and passed through a machine which guillotined long vertical strips of stamps which were wound onto individual bobbins. The coils show a join at every fifth stamp. The vending machines were taken out of use after a few months after their release in 1971 due to too many Malaysian 10 cent coins being found in the money boxes. Finding them on cover is very difficult. During the 1960s, the number of omnibuses were released in all of the British Commonwealth countries. The designs being identical, except for those countries where the Queen was not head of state. Victor Whiteley, stamp designer, was commissioned to do the artwork for the Sultan's portrait for these issues. The photographic proof for the Freedom from Hunger stamp of 1963 illustrates the difference with Sultan's portrait, denomination and name of country. Whiteley produced two portraits, one in national costume and the other in military uniform, illustrated here on the 20th anniversary of UNESCO stamps. These Harrison proofs of 1961 and 1965 are for designs that were not printed, and it is surprising that they have survived. Only the main towns had post offices until 1964, the rest of country having no postal services. 1966 saw the introduction of two new innovations, riverine post offices and mobile post offices. The riverine services ran out of Brunei town and Kuala Valite serving river campongs. The development of the road system allowed for the development of mobile post offices. The steel circular date stamp produced for the service read Wakil Post Bergerac Brunei and Brunei registered labels were used. This date stamp reads Brunei MPO and MPO was added in manuscript above Brunei on the registered label. The development of these services extended to the other main offices. Belai, the post office boat and the map illustrates the routes to the different kampongs. Wakil Post Bergerac Kuala Belai service began in 1963 and operated from Kuala Belai on Wednesdays, traveling up the Belai River as far as Bukit Sawat, where the postman slept overnight, continuing the next morning further upstream to Malilas. After a second overnight stop on the return journey, the boat arrived back on the Friday morning. There were two postmarks, Pajabit Post Bergerac Kuala Belai and Pajabit Lao Kuala Belai. The Javid Boss Bergerac Surya was the date stamp PPB Surya, serviced the Kampong Labi Postal Agency, which covered a large area. Initially set up in the 1950s, access from Surya was by the narrow gauge railway owned by Shell to Kampong Badas. From there, the mail went by boat. Subsequently, a tarmac road was built from Labi to Buhit Puhan, then by outboard motor to Badas, and then by railway to Surya. During the 1970s, work was carried out to build bridges and earthworks between Puhit Puhan and Sungi Liang, which on completion enabled mail from Labi to be sent direct by Land Rover. The service was twice weekly and Labi was upgraded to a post office in 1968. Pajabit Post Tutom was provided by Land Rover and Pajabit Post Lao Tutom was a river service from Tutong to the postal agency at Rambai, which started in 1964, providing additional postal services to the kampongs along the river. Mail to Rambai is extremely difficult to find. Temburong Post Office was situated in the district office, and after 1976, the name was changed to Banga. All mail to Brunei town being carried by boat. Sultan Sir Omar Alay Safudin, abdicated in favour of his son, Hassan 
Empire in 1968. And the Brunei Museum was opened in 1972 and a set of stamps was commissioned, designed by Clive Abbott. And it is interesting to see his pencil and watercolour sketches gradually developing the designs alongside the printed stamps. The increase in demand for international transportation resulted in a new international airport being built, which opened in 1974. A set of stamps was issued, printed by Bradbury Wilkinson. When the 1974 definitive issue was delayed, the post officers were instructed to backdate the circular date stamp to the 15th of July, the date printed on the blank first day covers and the intended day of release of the stamps. The actual date was 29th of August. At the airport, this backdating meant that the first day covers of the 15th of July were dated five days before the airport post office was opened on the 20th of July fact and philately collide. Three rubber cancers were produced due to the distortion of the image with wear and heat, which are illustrated here. <coughs> the light air letter was produced from the 2nd of June 1975, and these were air letters pre-stamped with the correct postage, but they were not well advertised and did not prove popular and were withdrawn. Used examples are not easy to find. Imperial Airways ran a weekly direct airmail service to Britain at a special rate. All letters had to have by VC10 written on the front and had to reach the Penang post office before it closed on the Friday. It was a quicker and cheaper service which made it very popular. I like the evidence of stamp production as you may have noticed and this frame of the 1974 definitive issue illustrates this. One sheet of the new design was set up, all with the same denomination. This was then printed in each of the colours for each denomination, in this case the 10 sen. The imperfect sheet was cut into individual stamps, which Harrison's placed on one of their cards with the proposed denomination for the colour written on the card. Once the colour was agreed, a bromide printing with the correct denomination was printed to check that all was correct, before a sheet in the correct colour was printed. Again, an imperfect stamp was put onto a Harrison card for approval. The same idea as the earlier appendix sheets by De La Rue. The four cent is a nice illustration with the proof of the four cent colour denominated in the ten cent, then the four cent proof and a block of four for printed stamps. The revised postal rates for 1st of May 1976 changed the local rate from six cent to ten cent. The exact Send stamps were surcharged 10 cent by the government printer using an automatic step by step photo printing device for making the forms. 23,000 sheets were overprinted, and the proof sheet of a complete imperfect pane with the 50 proofs, two times 25, separated with a gutter, is illustrated along with a block of four illustrating the positioning. The first stamp booklets containing uh, one pane with four times five cents and two panes of four times 10 cents, both initially with sideways watermarks, were placed on sale on the 24th of February, 1976. Over the years, the style of postmarks has changed as the number of sub post offices increased and they were given numbers, these examples being numbered 12 and 22. Instructional marks here were then insufficiently paid with the appropriate tax marks and the deficiency due and interesting areas to collect. Illustrated airmail envelopes are fun. The images on the front and the back of the envelopes, the smaller having round images or landscape images, and some envelopes have coordinating postcards. I end with the independent celebrations of 1984. When I returned, to Brunei in March last year to research for my book, I was asked to give a similar talk as part of their independent celebrations, as they are not aware of the history of their postal system. And with the time available tonight, I've only been able to give you a cursory overview of the postal system and the political events that affected it, as well as some of my favourite items. Thank you for your time and for listening, if you have been. Claire, that was amazing. You know, I, I have to say, I've never seen a more comprehensive study of, of a single island 
that that's just amazing. What we're going to do right now is we are going to start bringing people over. I understand that are, there are some people from the Sarawak study circle. I may I might have that wrong, but if if you're there, please raise your hand and I'll bring you over first. And if you'd like priority coming over, please um, you know please raise your hand and we will bring you over. So right now I'll turn it over to Rob Lutens to do some of the Q&A. Thanks, Joan. What a wonderful presentation. Um, just, just repeating what Joan said, I mean, seeing, you know, from start to finish, you know, the, the history of one island like that, that's just amazing, wonderful job. Um, we have a question from Drew Waverin. Do you have any information on the unissued 1979 harbors issue? He contacted someone with the Brunei uh, Postal Service, and the person there seemed annoyed that he was asking and told him nothing. Uh, no, I don't know anything about the unissued harbor issue. Okay. I'm not even sure I'm aware of it. Yeah, oh, is it the stamps that are on eBay all the time? Yes. There, there are some stamps for sale on eBay. They've, they've been around for about, well, they've been in several auction houses and they've been on eBay for about three, four years. Okay. Um, but I don't know where they've come from. They just suddenly appeared. All right. Um, our good friend Ingo Nestles brought up a good question. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your history store? Yeah. Ah, right. Well, most of you are, are, are collectors, so at some point in your collecting life, you may have suddenly gone, I know I've got this item, but I can't find it. And then you suddenly realise you've actually got too many collections and that some of your collections are actually too big. Hi, Len. Um, and we got to that point. So we then decided that what we needed to do was rationalise collections. And so um, we took several collections and removed them from our collections and actually created history store with about 200, how many? About 20,000 documents we started off with, which shows that we seriously had too many collections. And so history store has subsequently sort of evolved and we tend to specialize in the industrial revolution um and we are increasingly specializing in ephemera and then we take images from historical documents and we publish so we publish greeting cards and we've done tea towels and we do writing paper um oh. menus invitations and then because we specialized in using old images to create merchandise we then um had jobs from different museums and different people who are actually asked us to produce merchandise with their images on their behalf. Wow. Um, we've got a question from Rick Hordern. Um, At various times, how many stamps were printed? The question is, are some of these issues unusually scarce? Um, from a mint stamp point of view, uh, no, you can get most of the mint stamps without too many problems. I mean, the ones that are difficult are the ones, for example, which I haven't didn't show you with um, watermark varieties with the missing C or the missing A in, in the CA watermarks. Um, and the ones with the reversed and inverted watermarks, they're difficult. What is difficult is um, any, really any postal history pre-war because there wasn't the population. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, the, the oil was discovered in around 1929. It wasn't really being seriously um, exported or starting to be exported until the early 1930s. And they had no idea how much oil that they actually had. So they were very careful with their money. And then of course you had the issue where they got invaded by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, who did the scorch earth policy. So it took a number of years after the Japanese before full oil production uh, was resumed. 
And it really wasn't until the 1960s that, that they knew that they were financially safe, if you like. So um, a lot of the schools didn't happen until the 60s. Um, so girls didn't go to school to the 1960s. There weren't any schools for girls prior to about 64. Mm -hmm. um, so be because the Brooks had actually bankrupted the country, it, it, it's, it's always um, up until the, there was sufficient oil and they knew they'd got enough of it. It, it has always financially struggled. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there's very little postal history, particularly pre-war. You'll, you'll get it from Brunei town and um, but Temborong, Tutong, Mara, they're really difficult to find mail from. But mint stamps you can get. Okay. Dan, uh, Dan Walker, have you got a question? You need to unmute yourself. There you go. Clara, that was wonderful. Yeah. I really appreciate seeing the, the total story of Brunei. Um, how many of the, uh, uh, the 1895, um, well, I'll call philatelic covers, the bead and covers were, were, uh, were mailed from Brunei? Any well, idea? There were, they, they, from what we've been able to find out, I think there were uh, 200 P's and 200 Parkers. Ah. On, the, on the mass mailing of the 22nd of July. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. And are most of those still around? I mean, the, the highest. So probably at least an 80% survival rate. Why was uh, uh, Mr. Brook so uh, intent on taking over or, 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 you know, controlling Brunei? I don't know. Um, I, whether or not it was just his his arrogance that he felt that he would do a better job and he should own the land. I mean, it's why the country is split, because he managed to persuade the British government that he could have the rights to that land and it wouldn't harm the country. And although the Sultan said, you're going to split my country in half, the British government told the Sultan he didn't know what he was talking about. And James Brooke did. So they authorised the splitting of the country. And that meant that the sago that Brunei exported couldn't go down the river, and, and that seriously bankrupted the country. Um, and the, the political system, the early political system in the country, where you have the Pengarans, who the, um, they're all related to a sultan, so they're descendants of a sultan, and they had rights to land, and they had the rights to raise the tax on that land. It didn't go to the Sultan, it went to the Pengaran. And what um, Charles Brooke did was he actually paid off the Pengarans and bought the land off them. And he gradually encroached in and in and in. And then he split the country and he just tried very hard to absorb it. And his theory of splitting it was that the North Borneo Company could have the, the northern bit <laughs> and he would just take the rest. Wow, wow. And Brunei is not an island. It is part yeah. of Borneo, right? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's part of the island of Borneo. So below it, you've got Sarawak, and, and above it, you've got North Borneo, and then okay. you've got Indonesia uh, as the majority of the island. Mm -hmm. But Labuan is a, is a uh, island. Labuan is an island just off the coast. Yeah. Labuan was, was, of course, part of Brunei, but it had coal. Um, and the British wanted it as a coaling station. And so the Sultan said they could lease it. And, and the British government said, no, we don't want to lease it. We want it. Um, and the Sultan said, no, you can lease it. So the British government sent their gunships um, up Brunei River and faced the Sultan's palace, uh, loaded up the cannons and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to sign on the dotted line or shall we blow you up? <laughs> Yeah. So they signed, and Laban became um, British. Yeah. When was that? 18, oh dear, 1880s? Len will probably know okay. the date better than me. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. I really ha had a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, Edward O'San has a question. 
So yeah, was I, the use was the use of the five dollar and twenty five dollar from the nineteen oh eight river scene issue exclusively fiscal? Yeah. Or are examples of bona fide postal uses known? If so, you you'll find them. Sorry, sorry, carry on. Um, if okay, if so, do they have to be on cover, or can postal use be discerned from the stamps cancellation alone? You will find um, five dollars and twenty five dollars with a, with a circular date stamp on. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, they're CTO'd, um, and it's your choice if you have it uh, in your collection or not. They're not in mine. Um, I'll only have the $25 and the $5 fiscally used. If I found a $5 on a parcel label, I'd have it, because then you've got the evidence that it was actually used postally, but they were kept in the residence safe. They never went to the post office. Um, and he was the, the, the resident was the head of the, of the post office and the head of the judiciary. And the only reason they were actually printed was because of the change of law requiring stamps to pay um, the fees. Mm -hmm. I've never um, I've never seen a twenty five dollar on cover. And again, I'd, I'd want to really know it went through the post. Mm -hmm. I, it, it just it, it, as a postal amount, it makes no sense, you see. Right. Okay. Edward, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I see you're over here. So, uh, no, that's fine. Thanks. Very uh, wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. Okay, Len Stanway. You have to unmute. There you go. Hello. Uh, very good presentation indeed, Cloud. Quite very much enjoyed it. Um, come be coming on from that last question uh in malaya we do get chinese club packets uh, which do exceed 25 dollar postage uh, is there any evidence that the chinese in brunei use that system um there has been a reference um that they existed but there has been there is only one reference that I'm aware of, which talks about the fact that the Chinese had permission to do a club packet. Right. But I found no other evidence apart from that. Oh, thank you. It, it's difficult because, of course, the club packet went to China. Yeah. So unless you can find something in China that shows that the club packet left Brunei, um, and I said the, the reference only says that they have permission to do it. And, and I haven't seen any um, anything from the um, annual reports under the postal system that actually states what the postage rate would be or how the club packet was made up or any other reference to it. Yeah. So it's possible uh, it did exist, but finding the evidence of it is the issue. Yes, F uh, finding technical detail about club packets in malaya is very very difficult yeah so, uh, i mean they're not referred to in the annual reports at all no. and of course the the um whatever records um uh, outside of that, that that were in the brunei post office were destroyed by the japanese yeah. thank you Blair, how old were you when you first went over there? Yeah, uh, I wasn't. Oh. Oh, you you weren't there when you were named. No, no, no. I was born there. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. I never. I didn't catch that. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's why the the Sultan named me before I was christened. I was christened. I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch that. Catching. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. For no, how long, how long did you live there? I left when I was three. Okay. Wow. And it's actually, I think if the Sultan hadn't named me, I may well not have collected Brunei. But oh, it's because I have a name and it's the connection um, that actually, you know, it, it's the land of my birth. So that's why I collect it. Oh, yeah, very much. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions out there this evening? 
Well, Doug has one in the chat. He wanted to know what the Sultan did during the war. Did he? He he was actually um, under house arrest at the Astana. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hey, Happy New Year. This is Jun Shaw from New York. Uh, it's a fascinating, um, you know, this little country I never heard of. I just asked my 16 year old son, he's, he's studying war history. I said, you know, this place, it, it is interesting. Stan definitely helping learning history. So has anybody been to this country? You know, that probably my next stop to, to visit the country. How is it safe to go there? Safe? Oh, God, yes. yes. I mean, it is a very small country with a very small population that is extremely rich. Um, mm. And nobody has any reason to steal. Um, most of the Malays, I mean, to work for the government um, in any of the government offices and, and the, the forces included, you have got to be um, a, a Malay Muslim, a Bornean. And up until recently, you couldn't um, have a Brunei passport unless you're a Malay Muslim. So they have actually slightly changed things with the Chinese. But I mean, you can walk around there uh, very, very safely. Um, yeah, I don't think that crime really is an issue there. Okay, maybe we should organize a trip to go there together. <laughs> that would be, be our next project. <laughs> Field trip. Ingo, you had your hand up and then it went down. So yeah, know. it went down because it was sort of answering my question. I was going to ask uh, Claire if uh, there's any tourism there. It sounds like a fascinating little place to go to. And I've been to certain uh, little places like Ajman and, uh, and uh, well, Sharjah, which isn't so little anymore. But uh, Brunei sounds like one of those dream travel destinations if you like to go to offbeat places so do they really have a lot of tourism and hotels there they do um they, I, I don't the effects of covid have, have reduced tourism quite a lot but quite often people would come in as part of doing a sort of borneo trip so they would have a day in brunei town and then they would either go on to saba um or they'd go to sandakan um for the orang utangs or or they would go to sarawa um i mean when we were there we we spent most of the time we were doing research but you can you can go into the jungle and do trips into the jungle and you can do trips up river to longhouses um mm. the museum at the moment is is being rebuilt so you can't actually go to the museum um the, the main museum but there's the museum of the regalia or the royal regalia but you could do brunei i mean as, as a part of that part of the world it's it, if you do the three countries it's actually quite a fascinating area yeah i i was on a, a village on stilts in malaysia and the the lifestyle there the the nature of the people who have a their whole life in a village like that and living in boats and in longhouses it's just something to see and then give us some perspective of of how different people live their lives yes i mean i think the other interesting thing about Bruno, because it is so rich um if the sultan has something that it, he he wants to have an event um particularly if it's to impress other asian countries an amazing building will be built for that event but then they have no use for it and, and maintenance is not something that they really go in for um they're still trying very hard to get everybody off the kampong aya, off the houses of stilts but and that is a really fascinating area because it's called the kampong aya, which which is um the village on on water but actually it's made up of lots of different villages and historically they would have the different trades. So you'd have the village, the kampong, that did the silversmithing and, and um, the metalwork, because they were famous for their brass and for making um, cannons and the small decorative cannons that actually fired. Um, they were very famous for making those. And, and I have a, um, um, hmm, a brass gong. Um, 
which is an interesting shape. You hold it in your hand and it's got flat edges all the way around. But each one you tap has actually got a different sound mm -hmm. um, because they were incredibly skilled with brass work. And the silver work um, nearly died out, but they have reintroduced it. And it's, it's not quite as good quality as it used to be because I, I took out a piece that I needed repairing. Um, and somebody wrote about the, the Museum of um, Regalia being the Sultan's bling, and that's quite right. I mean, he, there, there used to be the joke oh, that when he came over here and his wives cool. came over, the first place they went to was Asprey's, you know, to buy another tiara and another whatever. Um, but yes, it's a very rich country. <laughs> so if you actually are a, a Brunei Malay, um, you get retirement age is 52 and you retire on a full pension. You've got free education anywhere in the world. Uh, you've got free health care anywhere in the world. Um, and really, you have a very nice lifestyle and you don't have to work very hard because the most people who do the work are either the Chinese who run all the businesses or you import Filipinos who do all your housework for you. <laughs> age 52, boy, what do they do daily? It's too young, but that's similar like like China, like in a, on the female side, they all retire at age fifty, right? In China, so the men probably retire at sixty, but you know, tiny country like that, uh, so they don't have the defense themselves. There's no, you know, I'm sure they have army, but <laughs> how, how well, they have they... the army, the air force, and the navy. Oh wow. Um, um, most of what they do is is to try and stop incursions from Indonesia to cut down the trees in the rainforest. The major uh, security is is around Syria and the oil fields, and that's carried out by the Gurkhas. Mm. And the Gurkhas have been there since um, the rebellion in in sixty two. Jason, you mentioned you've been there also. Yeah, I've been there um, just a few years ago, just before COVID, maybe 2018 or so. Spent about a week there. Um, so I was walking around BSB, the night markets, Kampong Iyer. Um, we took a boat into the Temburong area and up the river, and it was wonderful. So got a tour of the rainforest. So if, yeah, like Ingo was saying, you know, if you're looking for an off the beat and path yeah. destination, just yeah, give it a try. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. But I mean, I enjoy places like that that are a little different. So, um, you know, check it out if you're in the area. It's a cheap flight from, you know, Bangkok, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, or any of those places. And do you collect the area? The stamps? Sorry, what's that? Do you collect in that area? Um, I do not. No, I just went there for touristic purposes only. And I have no philatelic connection to the area. It's mm. huge, actually. Dan Walker. Yes, I have another question. Um, what's the status of your book, Clara? Uh, in progress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get sidetracked every so often to do something like tonight. <laughs> but we thank you. This is this is really wonderful. Oh my god. Now, uh, Charles, before I get to you, Doug, you had your hand up. Did your question get answered, or do you have a no, I, I was, thank you very much. I, I was asking about the tourism aspect. Uh, we have a relative for, who's from Sarawak. And uh, so we've been thinking about a trip uh, to see his homeland and um, uh, and wondering if uh, Borneo would be a good stop uh, or Brunei would be a good stop on the way. Yeah, I would do that. Not that you're biased, right, Claire? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Brunei is dry, by the way. Being a Muslim country, it's dry. I want to. That makes it tougher. <laughs> Claire, I want to say brava. It was wonderful, and uh, it's great to see you and everyone. And you, lovely to see you, Carol. I'm going to take my leave. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, Carol. Bye. Thank you. Charles, now off to you. Thank you for being a patient. No problem. Hi, Claire. Thank you very much. As usual, 
absolutely brilliant uh, and very informative. I'm just, I know it's slightly non-stamp, etc. Are you suggesting that the Sultan and the government are not particularly interested in their history if they're doing away with the historical dikes, etc., and the long, you know, the, the long uh, buildings, etc.? The Kampong Air. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a hygiene thing that they think with the Kampong Air because. Um, but they're, they're not interested in their, their postal system, no. Uh, they have a few collectors. Um, when I gave my talk to the Royal, I invited um, the staff from the High Commission. And in fact, the um, one of them who came uh, has started, started collecting when he was working here and based at the uh, High Commission, he hadn't realised that you could buy the old Brunei stamps um, because they're not available in Brunei. And so um, we've encouraged him to collect uh, and increase his collection. Um, and so we've now formed a small sort of philatelic group that we do on um, uh, the, through the internet. But um, yeah, particularly their philatelic history. They're, they're just really not really interested in it. Well, but and they don't on, really know much about it. But on the other hand, feather in your cap, the fact that you've actually started them to becoming interested. Maybe we start having, you know, monthly Zooms as we do with the Sarawak group. Yes. Or bring her into the Sarawak group. And do some well, talk. I, I we've got one of them who's joined the the uh, Sarawak Society as well. Um, so yeah, I, I am trying to work on them. Terrific. Now, Sabina also before I get to you, Lynn, Sabina put in the chat that the Sultan's son actually was married today. The, the, the Sultan's son of Brunei. So I googled it just to you know to make sure, and he's he's a good looking guy. Uh, it depends on which son he's had. The Sultan Bokai's, um, if you like, political marriage, he had five children with her, and he's still married to her. Then he married the air hostess, uh, and she had, I think she had either four or five. And then his third marriage, he had two children. So I think he's got 12 children. Oh my gosh! Well, this one. So I know his one of his daughters got married last year, um, but I don't know which son this was because he's got quite a few. <laughs> Abdul Martin, is it M A T E E N? That wasn't the one we met, was it? No, I'd I'd have to look it up. Anyway, yeah, that was you know pretty timely talk. Yes. Yeah, just so he could get married on the day that you were giving the talk. <laughs> anyway, Len, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm I'm glad, Claire, that you're uh, trying to promote co collecting in, with powers that be in Brunei, because trying to work with their philatelic bureau is a total and utter oh, nightmare. It, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And they don't reply to emails and um, everything takes forever. And yes, um, I mean, there's an awful lot of them in the postal system, but they seem to do very little except eat and drink. <laughs> Oh, yes. We, we, one of the things I wanted to find out was what documents the post office had post-war. Um, and apparently the post office um, offices have actually moved several times and they boxed everything up and moved them and they don't know where the boxes are. They also have um, a strong room. And they think the boxes might be in the strong room, but they're not sure. And the main problem about that is they've lost the key to the strong room. So they can't get into the strong room to find out what's in it. And they've lost the boxes. Yeah. So, um, yes, that's how easy it is to get philatelic information. I've been trying to get them to accept money for the last 18 months. 
Very well, nice. if, if you email me, I'll put you in touch with Shannon Nizam and Mr. Bakar, and maybe they can do it for you. All right, thanks. I just you. let you know, I learned, um, I, I discovered this Monday about this uh, five cent proof, the strip of five, um, and found somebody who collected Brunei on, on a chat format. Um, and he has got a P Parker cover, but it's dated the 18th of July. So it now means we've got three covers that uh, we know of that were posted on the 18th of July. So it's posted four days before the mass mailing. Oh, Dan, I hope that was your cat. You <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Mosher, you have to unmute yourself. Now we're unmuted. Yeah, the cat was blocking his view. <laughs> the cat was blocking my She's unmute. She's sitting on the keyboard and when she, yeah. I take it on live now? You're okay. <laughs> yep. It just, uh, I think I know the answer to my question, but to be honest with you, I don't collect the country. I'm focused on other places, but I have my dad's collection in that part of the world. And he didn't go into much detail, but he has a, a pile of the 1940s and a little bit earlier, mint. Was there dealers in London that were whole, bought wholesale lots of surplus stock from the Brunei that they were selling at auction? Because he used to buy in, he was in Nova Scotia, but he was buying stuff in London, mm. UK at auction. And so there's quite a bit, they're lovely stamps, but they're all mint. And I'm just wondering if somebody was kind of wholesaling them, or if they were selling off surplus stamps for the flower, for the collector's trade. Well, when um, Crown agents made an order for any of the Commonwealth countries, they, if you look at their day book, you'll see that there are the order that the country requires. And those are the sheets of stamps, which I explained would have a, a number put on it from an accountancy point of view. But then if you read the, the Crown agents um, books and, and the Delarue records, so much of it is sent to Crown Agents for the Crown Agents stock because Crown Agents sold the stamps of the Commonwealth countries uh, actually from London. So some of that can have been uh, um, excess Crown Agents stock that got on the market. So a lot of dealers in the UK would have bought from Crown Agents some material that had never actually gone out to Brunei at all. And you can often tell if it's not been out to the Far East because, of course, the climate means that the ink of uh, the the gum on the back of stamps um, quite often can go brown. Um, and if it's completely perfect gum, uh, quite often it never left the UK. That's what I was thinking. I, and a lot of the, the typical thing, short set up to the, well, the top one or two values are missing. But they are beautiful stamps, that's for sure. It's, it's a very pretty design. And if you like plating, I mean, you can you, know, you can have a field day because the, the fact that plates were used from 1907 to 1950 means there is wear and tear and you do get, um, there, there is a, a, a period where we've all been studying where there's a white line. Well, it's not a line, but anyway, it looks like somebody's hair got attached to the printing plate. Um, right. And then you can look at different, um, sheets of that issue and it'll either be there or it won't be there and um some of the retouches that you can see quite easily um and some of the the floors and some of them are really very small um but if you like plating it's a perfect issue for plating i enjoy sitting on these talks even in countries i don't collect it's very interesting i'm off to malaysia singapore in in february actually but for now it's not part of the itinerary that i'm on it's Poor, but it'll be nice to get to that part of the world. So, thank mm. you for watching. Tony, you have a question. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Joan. Um, Claire, I was fascinated to see all of all of your wonderful material there. Am I correct in assuming that, well, all of the covers that you're showing are obviously very rare, um, since there are such small usages. Um, does this mean that there are very few, there are very few, I could say, big collectors of this area? Um, 
I use that phrase lightly, um, the, um, you know, they're very difficult to get. I mean, most, most, most um, covers that have been, that are known, have been known for quite some time, I assume. Um, it's difficult. I have no idea how many covers there are because they are, they are difficult. But actually, a lot of Brunei collectors are closet collectors, as far as I can find out. In, in I suddenly, like I have discovered two new collectors this week who collect Brunei that I don't know anything about and have never uh, had anything to do with purely going onto a chat forum. I found out a lot more, I mean, the social media and using Facebook and, and belonging to different societies can actually uh, produce a lot of information. Um, and, and people have material, but they don't show it. They don't share it. They don't belong to a specialist society. They don't write. I mean, one of my main criticisms about collectors is they don't record what their research is. They don't publish it. Mm. And if it's not published, you don't actually know um, that it exists. So, for example, when Brian Cave wrote the book on the concessionary issue, Bill Toy didn't tell him he had the original sketches and the original designs from Robinson's archive. Mm. And so nobody knew that they existed. And yet you have the definitive book on that issue that doesn't include them. Mm. I think you hear of that quite a lot. There's a lot of, there are a lot of collectors who don't say what they have. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, know, in, I in my my stamp club in the Salisbury Society, we have someone who's a stamp collector, and he collects the stamps of that part of the world, and he put up his Brunei. Um, and I said to him, "You do know you've got some rare postmarks there, don't you?" So I don't know anything about postmarks at all. <laughs> so you can have people who have material and they, they have no idea what it is that they've got. That's the sheer delight of being an accumulator. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, well, when, that's when your collection at home here is like, it's the great black hole here. You know, a lot of stuff comes in, but not much goes out. <laughs> you know, that's the, yeah. But that was very enjoyable. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. Speaking about things that you have, I noticed you have a lot of the De, uh, De La Rue material, the proofs, the, yeah. the archives. So just curious, I, you know, I don't see them come up all that often. And to get all those with Brunei, if you might, did you get them all in one? No. Or no. you just kept um, uh, the The De La Rue archive came up, what was it, 70? 74 somebody might remember but around that sort of time is when the Dilla Rue was selling off their archive so I got the appendix sheet A then and Bill Toy bought appendix sheet B and he was always trying to persuade me to he said the two should be together um which they are now but um I, I think I mean I may sound uh be about to say heresy here but I like the the design and and the um <laughs> the process of creating an issue of stamps. I like the why it was being produced at that time. And I like what the printer was doing, the communication from the printer and those sorts of records. Once the actual stamp is done, for me, a mint stamp is boring because it hasn't carried out its duty. A mint stamp is, is a, a receipt that hasn't been used, if you like. So I then go on to the postal history. Um, but yes, I do like the the archival material. Um, the ones with Harrison's, you know, the the Whiteley sketches um, and and the proofs for the freedom from hunger. There's an interesting story about that. There was a um, a house that had some builders in, and they had a skip outside. I don't know if you have skips in America, but you know, you you hire them, and all the debris from your building works go into it, and then they get taken away. And there was a man who walked past this skip and he was a chap who, who quite often went rummaging in people's skips to see if he found anything interesting. And he found a whole load of paper in this skip and he kept turning them over and kept thinking, well, that's Queen Elizabeth and that's Queen Elizabeth and that's Queen Elizabeth. <coughs> Excuse me. So he went and found the, um, the chap in charge of the building site and he said, the paper in the skip, what, what are you doing with that? 
And he said, oh, we've just been told to strip out the house and, and the whole lot's going to landfill. He said, so if you want anything, help yourself. So the guy went back to the skip and I don't know how much he took. But it turned out that the, the owner of the house had been a printer at Harrison's. And this was Harrison's proof material he'd taken home that was all in the skip. So those bits that I showed you with the, the Whiteley material, um, that all came out of a skip. Hmm. All that like dumpster diving for stamp philatelic material, is that, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a new. <laughs> I don't think anyone would get that lucky. That's, that's tremendous. Well, okay. Any other questions? Yes, yes, yes. Frank Bloom. Where are we here? Here we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I got a dumpster diving story for you. <laughs> in uh, this is somewhere in the early '80s. One of the very big collectors in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, passed away. Both the husband and wife passed away within a few months of each other, and so the kids knew these people had lots of stamps. They went into the house and could find no albums, no stamps. But they found piles and piles and piles of magazines and newspapers all over the place. So they hired a dumpster and started shoveling. After a while, one of the piles fell over and out of the magazines were sheets of stamps. Full sheets of the 1890, uh, the 1820s issues and the 1895 pictorials and all this stuff, all the way up through the 1920s. All the, even including the high values, full sheets of them. That's how they stored their entire collection was inside of magazines. <laughs> Unfortunately, two dumpsters had already been taken to the dump before oh they found gosh. this. So they don't know how much actually went to the dump. <clears throat> but what didn't go to the dump was over $2 million in stamps. Oh my gosh. And so they know there's stuff missing because other dealers had known they had sold stuff to them. But they had absolutely no idea what went to the dump. <laughs> so wow. how much of it so yes, dumpster diving could <laughs> be valuable. I had a <clears throat> sorry, I had a friend who had uh, not, not a similar situation, but was aware of the fact that <clears throat> a colleague of his had stored a lot of mint sheets of uh, U.S. material in Life magazines. Uh, this guy's uh, wife uh, didn't know about it, and uh, some unscrupulous people went in and said, well, we're interested in, in the uh, uh, the magazines. And I think she said, well, you just take them, not realizing it was, they were full of stamps. Oh, hmm. that's that's awful. Yeah. We should oh. black all those students. Sorry. <laughs> Tony, back to you. Uh, yes, regarding the coil stamps, mm -hmm. was there Way of distinguishing the coil stamps apart from the fact of maybe having a pair with the join on the back or were they different different perforations or no so the only way of telling how do you know it's a coil stamp unless you've got the the join on the back you don't right mm. well, there's, there's there's a lot of ways i mean you often they were like I know in the New Zealand ones, there were the joins were numbered, which made it easier for the um, the folk on the the desks to be able to do the accounting. But um, yes, you've got to go for a strip. Mm. Mm. Uh, were the coils cut or uh, torn? They were well, they, they were guillotined and then put onto the roll. And then uh, after that, they're, they're perforated. I mean, it was a, 
a sheet of perforated stamps that was um, then cut and created into the coil. In which case you can tell if, if the two parallel edges are cut, uh, they're either coils or uh, perhaps a crafty uh, fabrication. Right. Mm. Mm. But there, there weren't coil machines on the on the uh, on the wall of the post office for after hours usage or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. They were? So they, they were the airport at Surya and uh, at Brunei. The, those were the three sites where they put machines. Ah, right, right. Mm. And, and how about the the booklet stamps? Are they they distinguishable from the sheet stamps? They're they're sideways watermark. Okay. Richard Moss, hi. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd like to endorse the comment about showing your stamps because on fr last Friday I did a Zoom show and, the, and I made a comment about one particular item I had recently purchased. And one of the members at the club I was doing the show to came up with very valuable information which when i passed it on to two or three other people who got similar material it started to put two and two together mm. Mm. well it's like doing the asc survey um you know, we know there were 28 in the first flight we know there were 10 on the second flight and i've not found anywhere that listed how many were on the uh, third flight but I've found nine so far. So I'm imagining that there's at least 10 that went on the third flight as well. Harris, you had your hand up and then I didn't get to you quickly. Yeah, that's all right. I was just going to go back to the um, dumpster story because I bought some auction locks in the UK and the auctioneer was very excited when he told me that these had been handed in by a dustman who'd found them in a, <laughs> in a dustbin. Do so it's know. not uncommon for this to happen. <laughs> wow. That's so I've, I've had a lot like that myself. But I paid a lot of money for it, unfortunately, or fortunately. Uh, Claire, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, I can't find the button today. I'm, it's hidden underneath the bar at the top. You showed a cover which had an AV2 marking on <laughs> it. Yeah. Do you know where that AV2 came from? Because it looks like a Hong Kong mark that I know of, but it might not be. Uh, there are a couple of books about AV2 markings. Did that cover circulate via Hong Kong, do you think? It wouldn't, no, it went via Singapore. And do you know? But it, but it, it could, I mean, it, it was anything that was carried on the British mails. There are books on the AB2. Yeah, I can't remember. Are. And I, you didn't mention where that one had been applied if you were able to identify it. It'd be interesting to see. Well, it, its route was via Singapore. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. It's not my area. I'm an island guy, being, Ireland, being an island, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit larger. Mm. Uh. We're a wee bit larger. You, Jeffries, thank you for staying up. Just a little. Yes. <laughs> it's very nice to see you and Happy New Year. Hi, hi, Joan. Am I here? Yeah. Okay, I'm on. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Good to see you. Hi, Claire. Thanks very much. Hi. Great, hi, uh, great display. Um, I just wanted to come back on the, this coil stamp that a couple of other people have mentioned and you, somebody asked whether you could tell it as a single there is a certain catalog which i probably shouldn't mention <laughs> that, that says that, that it has a different shade to the normal stamp so that the up the, the normal stamp the sheet stamp is brown and the um no sepia and the coil stamp is pale brown and i just wondered if if that was justified because i've never seen one and we don't have one in our um, reference collection. You, you haven't seen a coil? No. Ah, right. Um, and I just wondered if it really did have a different shade. I, I'll have a look it... tomorrow and then I'll let you know. OK, thanks. That would be great. Hmm. Oh, and the other question I was going to ask, somebody's already asked is, when can we get the book? 
but um, <laughs> you, you've answered that one. So thank you. Oh, that's terrific. Cheers. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. And thanks, thanks one Joan. question to a graduate student when he's defending. <laughs> yeah. Austin, always the answer is soon. Yes. Another, <laughs> another, another follow on there about the, the book situation. Um, a lot of a lot of collectors eventually do produce a book which is of their collection and that is that is really quite valuable because i know i don't get to go to many exhibitions but if i do go to an exhibition there's no way in the world that i can see the bottom two rows of the exhibit you know, I mean, I, my knees just won't take getting down that low to be able to closely look at it. And, and it, it is really quite valuable that, that when there are good collections, if they can be published, you know, with a bit more detail or a bit more anecdotal material or whatever, but you can actually sit back and, and read it and look at it and see what it is. Like, I mean, I know some of the collections you know, similar to, to which I know a little bit about or and that where I've actually got the, the um, scans of their exhibition. And it is so much nicer to be able to sit and look at it on a, a big screen, have your cup of coffee and, and, you know, be able to zoom in and look at the, just the bits that you want. And having a book is just like that, really. And so I really do commend everyone who has particularly some of these, you know, the really good exhibits it would be good if there were books. It is most important to publish. I think it's equally important to, do, to give presentations like this, especially oh, yes, if yes, yes. you put on YouTube where researchers outside the philatelic mm -hmm. community will actually yeah. stumble upon it by typing a keyword. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think these type, you know, there's several groups that put them on YouTube and social media. I think this has been very, uh, very valuable for mm. the hobby. And I, I hope, you know, we, I encourage historians to come to our talk. And if, I, if I hadn't seen this talk, I wouldn't have known about these covers and these early issues for Bruno. I mean, it's, it's most important. It's every, you're being commended for doing it. It's most important. Mm. Tony, in my case, uh, getting down uh, looking at an exhibit, uh, looking, getting down uh, to watch the look at the bottom two rows, I can manage that. But my knees will allow that. It's getting standing up again that I have the problem with. <laughs> I always miss the top. So mm. <laughs> I've actually heard there was there was some. This is a, 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 a side point, but. I've actually heard that there was some exhibit recently where the the frames weren't vertical, but they were at a, a bit of an angle. And I'm not, and I think that made it, you could see the bottom rows much, much better, and you could still see the top rows as well. So I'm not sure where that was, but I, I heard tell that that happened. Yeah. Mm. I'd like them to put the little QTR codes so you could go down with your phone and have a narrative and you could bring things up, but I don't think they'll do that. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? The, uh, in, oh. uh, in Stampa, the Irish National Show, we have the A-frames, so they're at more of an angle. So people like Tony may be able to perhaps get down to see the third row. Uh, and I do recall many years ago when I lived in the States, there were some six sheet frames in a little local society, which was very weird indeed. And while you're mentioning QR codes, uh, I've just got my uh, Dublin Censor Office exhibit, which won the best in show here in Dublin in October. It's going to the States. And what I now have going with that is a QR code which shows, which is going to show the uh, key items for judges to look at so before they even come to the show, say they don't have to go say, well, 
where are the ones I should be looking at? Where's the ones with the red line around it or the green key line or whatever? Eight or 10 covers. I don't know how many sheets I haven't decided yet, but QR codes, I think are going to be a very interesting way for people to get to see at the company. Interesting, you know, I think it's going to take off a little bit uh, more more uh, in the near future. When you have published, Claire. Will... Oh, did that silence everybody? Oh, dear. <laughs> when you have published, Claire, will um, details of how to procure, it's a lovely word, that procure, um, how we may procure it be sent via Joan? Yes, of course. Good, good. Happy to post it. Mm. Well, Claire, I know it's really late over there, and I thank you so, so much for, for staying up. Any other questions? Or should we like Claire and you, and who else is from England? John? You. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. You guys are staying up really late for us. Mm. When you get to, if you come over to the United States, we'll have to have coffee and stuff and to sort of make it up to you. <laughs> so, but, um, anything else? Mm. Oh, I'll yes. just say thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, Claire. Oh, yeah. Not a subject I knew nothing about. You had yeah. a wonderful presentation, a lot of material there. Yes. Once again, yeah, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. And thank you, Joan, for organizing it. Uh, well, mm. Rob, Rob was my, you know, Rob is my uh, partner here, and he does oh, a well, lot. Rob as well. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Joan. No, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll hope we'll see you in February. Ed Grabowski's talk should be pretty. Yeah. Mm. Uh, sorry, sorry to. Hold this up, Claire. Do you do you give displays to local societies? Yes, I do. Where are you based in England? Dorset. Oh no, you're a bit too far from where I live. Where I are you? That was a proposition. <laughs> <laughs> where are you? The Leighton Buzzard, right. in Bedfordshire, and that's quite a trek from Dorset to to, uh, <laughs> to us. <laughs> okay. Well, Claire, is your library open? Did they come to a field trip? Yes. I mean, if, if people want to come and see the Post History Library, they're, they're very welcome. Mm. Wow. Mm. They, they just need to make an appointment. Yeah, Jan and Claire have a lovely wow. library. Adrian's here. I'm not sure if he has, if he's listening. But um, Adrian, you. So uh, that's he, he does a Sarawak society also. Hmm. He has an interesting uh, presentation where it's very personal. Again, like you, Claire, you know, it's the family history. His is a family history through the hmm. country, philatelically. That's what I love about stamps. I love what you that personal connection you have with the material. So mm -hmm. I wish I had personal connections to like that inverted Jenny and the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no such luck. And I haven't been successful at dumpster diving either. So <laughs> you guys are gonna play the lottery over here, so. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. You all can right, let go, or you know, I'm here all night, so. So yeah. But we could we could let Claire get some sleep. If she... All right. Look, thank you very much. I'll see you on. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks Claire. Claire. That was excellent. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for staying. Thank you, Claire. Brilliant. <laughs> Tap him on the shoulder. <laughs>